We've spent the <clears throat> last five weeks looking at the subject of the apocalypse, which is simply the a transliteration of the Greek word for the uncovering or the revelation of the events leading to Christ's second coming to earth. There are many different views and angles on this very important subject, and so we felt it necessary to go back to develop a strictly biblical interpretation regarding the second advent of Jesus Christ. This is the basis of our faith. This is the basis of our hope. This is the thing that is the focus of our Christian lives. Not our health, not our wealth, it's the second coming of Jesus Christ. For no matter where we are, no matter what we've been through, the second coming takes us out of all this nonsense we go through in this life. On the first week of our studies, we discussed the question, why now? And the answer is we live in such a rapidly changing world where all the parameters of the past have been pushed aside along with an unstated belief that all this is going to make life much better for us. Unfortunately, we seem to be met with more challenges in living than ever before, and it raises these questions. <clears throat> can the world, for instance, can the world, world's population keep on expanding? Is the world able to sustain the ever-increasing population that we're producing? Where is all the energy for the future going to come from? Which ideology is going to rule the world? Is our freedom increasing or decreasing? And amongst all these questions which science purports to have the answers to, there are two nagging questions, which are, are very simple, and which science is remarkably silent on. What are those two questions? Where do we come from? Where are we going? Science tries to tell us that we have all the answer and we, it has its proponents such as Dawkins, <coughs> who are very, very evangelical in the fact that, he, I think he said about five years ago, within 20 years, science would have all the answers done. I'm hopeful that I'll be living in 15 years but I doubt whether Mr. Dawkins will be. Interesting. The Bible answers these two questions very simply and easily. It simply says, in the beginning, God. And, in the end, God. And if you're smart this morning, you'll begin to think about the end. Because in the end, it's God. And what your relationship with him is, is the thing that matters. And it's interesting to note studies that psychologists have done who say that the main factor in a happy life is that of faith. Faith comes from hope. You don't have any hope, you don't have any faith. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7 says, For we walk by faith and not by Sight. And Hebrews chapter 11 picks up on this thought. In verse 3 it says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so the things which are seen are not made with things that are visible. What an outstanding commentary 2,000 years ago on the atomic theory that so enraptures the world today. So our approach to interpreting biblical prophecy has been as follows. Firstly, we take the literal meaning as the prime meaning. Secondly, we believe that the prophetic scriptures were given by the inspiration of God. And thirdly, that the prophecies were written well before the events. In other words, they were prophetic. And we've been looking at the book of Daniel. We've been comparing Daniel and Revelation. We said Daniel is the, is the big picture of what's going to happen in the end times. Revelation is the little cameos, little things that happen at the end. And Daniel has always been attacked by skeptics. And the reason is simple. As the skeptics do not believe in God and 
so they don't believe in the inspiration of God. They therefore assumed that it would be impossible for Daniel to have been written so accurately about the events which were to follow in history. He forecast the nations which were going to oppress Israel and the kingdoms. And so the skeptics came back to the conclusion that Daniel had to be written about 100 BC because it's the only way it could have been written so accurately forecasting the events. However, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were found in 1948, have now shown and proven because Daniel was part of that series that the events happened or the events were written by Daniel about the fourth century, at least probably older than that, the fifth century BC. So we have the prophetic utterances of Daniel can be taken as being God speaking. The most important prophecy in Daniel <clears throat> is referred to as what we call the 70 weeks prophecy. Remember how we went over this? And it's an important prophecy because it prophesies the end of the world as we now know it. Daniel 24 says this, it says 70 weeks are determined. It's a very strong word, very determined for your people and for your holy city. Now this is talking about Israel and Jerusalem. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. If you do a study into this, you find this is what the, it's talking about the end of the world as we know it and the coming of the Messiah. Now, let's go back to this phrase because we've dealt with this, but it's good to go back and just review it now. It says in the Hebrew, the phrase 70 weeks means 70 weeks of years. You can go back and refer to the, I think it was the second um, in the series, which expands on this. And each week stands for seven years, or a day per, per year. Therefore, 70 weeks is 70 times 70 years, which adds up to 490 years. So if we're going to find out <clears throat> and understand this prophecy well, we need to find out when was the start of this 490 year period started. Then we can find out when the world is to end. Very simple, isn't it? So this is what we're going to, this is what we did. This will give us an idea of the prophecy. Now, there's been a lot of confusion over this prophecy, mainly over its starting point and then the length of, the, of a year. Is it a year mentioned here as a Hebrew 360 prophetic year or does it include feast, uh, feasts, does it include jubilee years, all that sort of thing. And down through the ages, there's been a lot of discussion on this until last century, there was a, a very learned English theologian called Martin Anstey. And he wrote a book called The, Ro the Romance of Biblical Th um, Chronology. And in this book, he points out he made two major discoveries. I'm going to share these with you now. Firstly, that the ancient secular chronologies, and that you see the... the uh, the commentators hate using anything from the Bible because that's biblical. It can't be right. But the, the amazing which is, thing which has come out of the study that Anstey did was that prior to Alexander the Great, around 330, 340 BC, the dates are notoriously unreliable and they're out by about at least 80 to 82 years. And the second point he found out is that if you use 360 years, uh, 360 days is a, a calculation which a lot of the prophetic people have tried to do to try and get the dates right. You get all confused, but in actual fact, if you use it correctly, you end up with exactly the same dates because you've got to add in all the feast dates and all the uh, holidays that the Hebrews used, the, Isra the Israelites used to adjust to keep the years exactly as 365 days. So it makes no difference wh whichever you use. And thirdly, and this is the major thing, 
The Bible contains the only ancient records of dates that can be relied upon. Isn't that amazing? Written by 40 different authors over uh, about 1,500 years, and yet it is so cohesive and so exact as to its dates. In the secular stuff is a mess. The Bible, very clear, very straightforward. And as we discussed in our second of the series, the date of the first de decree to rebuild Jerusalem was issued by a Persian prince called Cyrus to rebuild the temple at Jerusalem. And that was 457 BC. So as, as we discovered, we can accurately start the beginning of this 490 year period at 457 BC. Now we come back into Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, because there's a very interesting prophecy given to Daniel there. And in Daniel 9, 25, the angel says to him, Know therefore and understand, understand this, that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, right? The command to rebuild Jerusalem, which is the beginning of the, of the 490 year period, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The seven weeks was just a, a period of doing some rebuilding. And then 62 weeks, that equals 69 times seven, which equals 483 years. So when I went to school, I started off with the, the uh, start of the Prophecy was given to us for 457 BC. You add on 483 years, and that brings us up to AD 26. So what happened in AD 26? Well, it's now generally accepted that Jesus was born about 4 BC, and in his 30th year, he began his ministry. And this is what we read in Matthew 3, verse 16. Uh, when, he'd, when he'd been baptized, Jesus came up immediately. When Jesus had been baptized by John in the River Jordan, he came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That was a revelation of Jesus as the Messiah at that point, and straightway he goes in, into the desert for a fast, comes back and he opens up the scroll. We read this in Luke 4, 19, 4, 18 in the uh, synagogue and he reads, for the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And so this is, and Messiah simply means the anointed one. So here, here was the anointed one and given to us in AD 26. And we know that Jesus ministered for three and a half years, which ended with his crucifixion. So it's apparent that the final week of the 70 weeks prophecy, this important final week, started in AD 26 and went for seven years. Now, the first three and a half years of it was Jesus ministering. And it finished in AD 30. He was crucified in AD 30. That was the date. Now, Daniel 9, 27, 9 verse 27 says, Then he, Jesus, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. What does that mean? The sacrifice and offering is referred to us in Galatians. When Paul writes to, about Galatians and says, all the law, all the sacrifices, all the offerings, all the feasts are all incorporated and fulfilled in the death and the life and ministry and death of Jesus upon the cross. So in the middle of the week, he brings an end at the cross. He brings an end to the sacrifice and offerings. Now, a lot of Christians today want to keep the sacrifices that Israel kept. Just believe in Jesus and you keep all the sacrifices. 
and all the sacrifices and all the way the, the, the offerings were made, they all speak to us of Jesus coming. They all speak to us of the love of God. They all speak to us that there's a God up there who loves us and cares for us and he's got a purpose for us. It's good to know what happens in the feasts and the offerings. But don't dwell in that. Dwell in the, in the fulfillment of them, which is Jesus. I'm grateful. I'm grateful to Israel for what it's done. And it's good to know what she's done. What God has done through Israel, I should say, in the laws that he gave to him. It's evident that the 70 weeks of prophecy did not continue to its ultimate ending. It stopped at 69 and a half weeks. And I want to ask you a question. Why did it stop? What's the greatest? Of, God said you, you got 70 weeks, guys, and then it's, she's, it's all over. Why did it stop? Great answer. Somebody's just said God's grace. It's the best answer you can give. We're entered into, a, into an age of grace. This is what grace is all about. God stopped his judgment because he saw the sacrifice of his son stop the judgment, God's judgment upon the earth. And we're in an age of grace. Thank God we have a God that is a loving God and a merciful God. It's prior to the cross, you know, Abraham had called, uh, God had called Abraham and his descendants, the nation of Israel, to be a holy nation, to demonstrate to the world God's love and compassion and righteousness. But Israel, over the years, as the Bible records, failed God miserably. Israel was called God's bride. But scripture tells us that she committed spiritual adultery. The church is now called the bride of Christ. And she, Israel committed spiritual adultery when she worshipped other gods. The first commandment was given to Israel in Exodus 20 verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. And God's desire was was given to us in Exodus 19, verse 6, and you shall be, this is what he said to Israel, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That was in the song we sang right at the very beginning. And then the prophet in Jeremiah 2, verse 13, brings a charge against Israel. And Jeremiah the prophet said, and I quote, to my, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. What's that saying? What's that mean? It means that, that we draw our living water off God, our, off our relationship with him. You know, they say to us, we can only last three days without water, and then we're dead. Our life is dependent upon water. I remember when I was a kid, actually, we had to, remember we used to have to give, stand up in front of the class and give talks? And I was about eight, I remember doing this in my primary class, and I suddenly thought, I'll talk on water. And, and the old teacher was very effusive about it, and I really never understood it till later on, the importance of what water is in our everyday life. You haven't got water, you can't wash. One of the great things of civilization is running hot water. There's nothing like it. Go into the third world for a couple of weeks without that, and you'll soon understand what a great asset that is in our, in our civilization. But it says there that, that in, in 2 verse uh, 13, um, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain, the living water. What it's really saying is from him we draw our life, we draw our breath, we draw our very being. We get out of, out of God and his spirit. And that they instead have hewn themselves reservoirs of water. They've tried to make reservoirs of water in other things. And we see that in our, in our community, in our nation. We live in a very blessed nation. We don't have to want for a thing. The government provides everything for us. 
if we can't provide it for ourselves. And people turn to that. I often say in New Zealand, we're one of the first countries to go into social welfare. We did that in 1938. It was brought in by a bunch of well-meaning Christians. But the government has become God instead of the church. Instead of people knowing how to trust God, the government. So we always think, well, the government should pay for this. The government should do that. We've hewn for ourselves cisterns that cannot hold water. They never give us the, the sustenance of life that we long for, that we care for. There's only one thing that can really feed our souls, and that's the Spirit of God in our life. And then the Jeremiah says again in verse three, chapter 3, verse 8, Then I saw for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery. I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. He divorced Israel and the promises to her. Why? Because she would not believe and follow his word. But you know, God is still loving. I love this and he carries on in verse 12 this, in, to anticipate God's mercy. He says, return backsliding Israel, says the Lord. I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not remain angry forever. You know, we serve a good God. What a wonderful thing to know that there's a God, no matter what we've done, no matter what, how we've failed God. If we come to Him with a heart after Him, He turns again the days we have left and makes them live for us. And so we come to the cross, and this is the great message of the cross. Instead of a small nation of people enjoying a relationship with God and showing the rest of the world who God is, that was Israel's purpose. And But because of Israel's adultery, this opportunity was lost to Israel. But here's the good news. It was opened up to everybody else in the world. And I love that verse of John. That's why John 3.16 is so important. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever, 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 forget the nation, forget the tribe you come from, it's whoever, you individually, every single person in the world, every single Gentile, it was open to him. God opened up an age of grace at the cross. That's why the cross calls a, that's why God called a halt to the 70 years of, of uh, 70 weeks of years because of that. This was prophesied again by, by, in the Old Testament by Hosea 2.23. Then I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people. And they shall say, you are my God. I'm grateful to God. I'm grateful to God for Israel. Because she brought, because of Israel, we have had the Old Testament. We've had the word of God given to us. And out of out of, Messiah, out of Israel came the Messiah. Now, the week after that, we looked at the visions of Daniel 2, 7 and 8. And all these visions are contemporary of one another, and they foretell the rise of four empires which oppress Israel, Babylon, Medo-Persian, the Greek, and the Roman empires. The most important Part of these visions are the explanations given to us about them. And these visions tell of a ten-nation confederacy or union that in the last days will arise out of the Roman Empire and how out of that union will arise an outstanding figure who we now know will be called the Antichrist. In a few months' time, we're going to do a series on the Antichrist which will give us a whole new understanding how to interpret end times. Then in the fourth week, we looked back historically and we saw that the majority of the early church fathers had a 
post-tribulation, pre-millennial view of end times. Now, what on earth does those things mean? I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes just sorting that out, because once you've got this clear, you're about to read everybody who writes on this and understand it all. There are three basic words, or four words. There's amillennial, premillennial, post-tribulation, pre-tribulation. What do they all mean? If I talk to you in the, if I said, if a person is a theist, a theist, you'd know that they believe in God. If I call them an atheist, you'll believe they don't believe in God. And it comes from the Greek. The little word a means uh, not. Virtually interpreted as not. All right, same thing. It's an easy way of understanding it. So when we look about the when we talk about the millennium or the premillennium, it means there's a thousand years reign of Christ and His kingdom upon earth. An amillennialist says that that period started about AD seventy, some say AD two seventy, but take your pick. For me. The Bible teaches the millennium is a thousand year rule and reign of Christ of peace and prosperity. All I can say as I look over history, I can't see it. So I rest my case, just look back at history. A millennialist's view, I think, is not a sound view. Premillennial simply means this. You see the the view up there, a millennial, a millennial view. Now let's go to the pre-tribulation view. We got that up there. There's pre-tribulation view. There's the Jesus crucified in AD 30. There's a gap of mercy which we're in now, age of mercy. Ten nation union we'll see will be created. Antichrist will come into the temple. At that point, the church is raptured, goes to heaven. That's pre-tribulation. The church is taken out before the, tri the tribulation period upon the earth. As we pointed out, I think it was last week, that the tribulation period is essentially upon Israel. And uh, we read the last part of Romans that was read to us this morning says that we've got nothing to fear because we're, we who are Christians are in the love of God. We've got nothing to fear about going through the tribulation. But a lot of people think there's a pre-tribulation view. And then comes the millennial reign of Christ at Jesus' second coming. He comes twice in the pre-tribulation view. Then we have the post-tribulation view. The only difference between those two views is the rapture is there instead of there. In the pre-tribulation view, it's at the beginning of the period of three and a half years. The post-tribulation view, it's at the end of that three and a half year period. And it ushers in the hundred year reign of Christ, a thousand year reign of Christ, the millennium. So the tribulation, whichever way it is, pre-trib or post-trib, it's always pre-millennial. Do you see that? Can we just go back to the pre-tribulation? Pre-tribulation view is pre-millennial and the post-tribulation view is also, as we can flow that up now, is post-tribulation view is also premillennial. All right, very clear to see that. So let me just say this then. I'm going to use those terms again now. Uh, you understand them. Uh, in the early church fathers were essentially post-tribulation. That was the view of the early church fathers. Then about in the 5th century, Augustine of, of Hippo and the Council of Ephesus, about 323, I think it was, AD, introduced the millennial, the amillennial view of the church. They said the millennium has already started. And we saw, and then we saw that how the pre-tribulation Pre-millennial view came into vogue in the early part of the 19th century. And now 
there's been coming back into view again is the post-tribulation view, which says, which is, as we've seen, is the only view which really the Bible can support. There's very little scriptural, if any scriptural, reference to pre-tribulation in the um, in the Bible. The only one, the major one they work on, I think, is in. Uh, in um, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, where it says, the angel says to John, come on up here into heaven. And so they take that as being a, a forerunner of the rapture. All right. <clears throat> and then last week, we looked at the subject of the Great Tribulation. And in particular, the question of whether the church goes through the tribulation or whether it is taken out before it. And as we've said, there's very little scripture to back uh, the point of the church being taken out before the tribulation. And so we love that verse, those verses in Romans chapter 16 that were read to us at the beginning of the service. Now to him who is able to establish you according to the gospel, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made evident and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God. To God alone be glory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a great comfort in knowing that no, no matter what this world goes through, God is in control. No matter what man teaches, God is in control. No matter who we are, God has offered us the ability to have a relationship with Him and to be filled with His Spirit and know the times in which we live and be able to interpret them. And this is the great thing about the, this book, the Bible. It's something that we can rely upon. It is a reliable commentary on God's purposes on this earth. 